what is going on everybody welcome back to another form check friday it's friday i'm your host bam bam bigelow and you're here on the calgary barbell channel now first off before we get started if you're interested in submitting your video to be looked at which is you know what we do here go over to calgarybarbell.com here click on this little button that says fcf bada boom bada bing bada boom and uh there you go there's a submission form give us some details this box right here says any additional info or comments fill some stuff in there let us know what you're dealing with what you're struggling with what you've tried what's worked what hasn't all that kind of stuff gives me a lot more to go off of when it comes to giving you a better critique of your technique potentially offering some programming advice uh it gives me a lot more to you know use as a resource when i'm coming up with you know suggestions for you um we're gonna start off where we left off last week which is with tebow here for those of you who maybe weren't with us last week tebow is doing some deadlifts here and i'll give you a little bit of the context so tebow says uh he usually pulls barefoot this is a uh, 132.5 kilos and he says he's been working with a bit of a higher hip position because he says his hips normally shoot up a fair bit um, his deadlifts, he said, feel great, and he has no issues, no low back pain at all, but he's wondering if he should be concerned about his back rounding. So he says he notices his back rounds, and he wants to know if it's, uh, if it's something to be concerned about. So first off, generally speaking, if you're not having pain, um, it, you, I, I, it's, it's probably not productive to be worried about pain, right? It's a big psychological link if you if you're interested in more of what makes people hurt and get hurt just punch in biopsychosocial model of pain on google look that up it's interesting your brain decides the pain anyways um so first off no i wouldn't be worried about your backgrounding uh it looks like probably not even enough flexion to be worried about from uh an efficiency a technique standpoint so yeah probably not something to worry about but I what, what I will talk about a little bit is that I might actually widen your stance just slightly so when we come off the floor uh, right now you've got a pretty long femur so there's a big distance here to here if we widen the stance out a little bit it's gonna slightly slightly shorten that distance it's also gonna allow you to kind of have your knees um, a bit more pointed out which will allow you to hold, hold a little bit more what's called external rotation in your hips right and sometimes that little bit of external rotation allows us to create a bit better position in the low back allows us to get a little bit more work out of the posterior chain sometimes that's more efficient i'd give that a shot that'd be one of the things i'd look at here so a bit of a wider stance it is going to mean that you're going to have to widen your grip which is going to make for a slightly longer range of motion but a lot of the times widening the grip is gonna allow us to get a bit better sensation in the back, sometimes allow us to kind of feel a better brace. And if that's the case, it's gonna allow you a bit more consistency. So, especially if we're seeing the hips, you know, rising up behind you, and that's a problem you've had in the past. I don't see this as necessarily a super high hip position. Uh, I think it's a pretty, you know, pretty standard spot to be pulling from, but yeah, I think we could use uh, a slightly wider stance, like I said. That's gonna allow you to push your knees out just a wee wee bit into your arms, uh, and that may help a little. The next thing I'm gonna point out here is that lockout. I would actually try to cue you almost like I would cue a sumo lifter. And a sumo deadlift, a lot of the times, we're gonna think about locking the knees slightly early, right? So we're gonna think about locking the knees just before we lock the hips, because what happens is if we forget about, the, whoops, whoa, whoa, whoa. If we forget about the hips, or sorry, the knees before the hips, then a lot of times we'll get to lock out and it'll look like this, right? Our knees are still kind of unlocked, kind of soft. Not sure if you're looking to compete or not, but if you are looking to compete, that's a very, very big thing. And we always want to make sure that we're really locking the knees out and showing the judges that we have this full standing tall kind of position. So that would be my advice for you. Uh, I hope that helps, Tebow. Next up put this on loop and we have Lucy so Lucy's benching here and she says this is 145 for five uh, at eight she's been training powerlifting since 2014 so definitely no no newcomer to this whole thing uh, competed a few times and looking to start taking competing more seriously now 
She says her biggest issue is with her butt coming up off the bench. And she says she's tried a lot of things in terms of foot position, um, pulling her feet in more underneath her, going wider in her stance, um, and cueing her leg drive, trying to cue leg drive back instead of up. So those are a lot of suggestions I often give people when they when they email in and are asking about getting better, uh, you know, or, or getting better leg drive or trying to keep their, their butt on the bench. So she says her reps get a little sloppier throughout the set uh, and she's wondering how she can work on staying tighter throughout a working set. So we have a video that uh, should have just come out by now uh, about the new bench rules in the IPF. And one of the rules is that there's now an acceptable amount of your butt that needs to stay on the bench. So it's no more that uh, if some of your butt is on the bench, then that's fine as long as it don't, doesn't come completely off. You know, the rule used to kind of be uh, if you could see daylight, right? Now, the rule is that there's an acceptable amount and this kind of like tilt in the pelvis is actually, I think one of the things they're probably targeting because you can see it's kind of more like the inner thigh and bottom uh, of your hips that's that's sitting on the bench more uh, as opposed to this part of your butt and again I, it feels weird to do this much uh, talking and pointing at people's butts but uh, <laughs> it's a it's a thing now so we're gonna try to analyze it one of the big things that I think I would get you to do is first off you mentioned competing the IPF and you mentioned that you're gonna have to have your feet flat to me this looks like I think we're actually missing the mark on that even a little bit so I would probably try to and uh, this rack looks like it's probably going to limit you a bit but i would try to go slightly wider and and really drive your knees out what i think that might help with is it's going to get your feet a little flatter it's going to change the knee position back here more and hopefully get a tiny bit more of your butt down on the bench because I, I do think this is going to be one of those borderline cases where we're looking at okay does this lifter have the acceptable amount uh of of their butt on the bench and what exactly that means I'm hoping is clarified, but uh, you know, these are the calls we have to make now. In terms of keeping the bench tighter throughout the set, I actually have some additional advice for that. It looks like one of the things we're utilizing here is a pretty heavy touch. So we are seeing the bar come down. We are seeing you kind of sink a little bit. We're seeing a, a, a lessening of tension when the bar's on your chest, right? So we see this, if we go, let's try and go frame by frame actually, uh, and see if we can, right. So. We've got, this is kind of our arch here. There's your butt. Um, we'll use a line on the leg. What else can we get an idea for? There's the shoulder. Now, let's go forward a little bit and see, see how all that stuff kind of loads down a little bit. We're like relaxing a little into the pause. This is a really common tactic and I don't think necessarily a bad one, but what I do think is that if you're somebody who struggles with their butt coming up off the bench, and struggles with consistency as set go, sets go on and wear on, I would say that maintaining more consistent leg drive, consistent positioning tension could be a good angle to take. So I might actually try to almost reformat your bench slightly uh, and get you to a point where we have that consistent tension throughout, where we have that more consistent pressure up in through your body and through your leg drive so that the, the butt, the amount of the butt that's on the bench isn't changing throughout, rather it's, it's static because we're applying, you know, 100% of the pressure the whole time instead of, you know, applying 100% uh, on the way up as we press, but during the descent and the, the touch, you know, maybe we're only applying like 50%, right? And the other way you can look at it is if we are gonna continue to sink and continue to use this little bit of looseness in the bottom during the pause, let's see if we can get that 50% that you're maintaining uh, up to maybe 70%. So try to maintain more tension, right? If we don't wanna totally reformat the bench and go from a heavier touch to a lighter touch and this sort of varied leg drive tension and set up, uh, set up positional tension, whatever you wanna call it, then let's try to get just more maintained during that lightening of position and tension. Hopefully that makes sense. That's kind of a new concept I haven't really uh, explained in that way in a while. So, All right, so our next lifter is Pita, I wanna say. Pita, Peta, uh, apologies if I'm mispronouncing your name. Uh, let me see if I can get the crop to display maybe a better look. There we go. 
and we can see the full squat. So, uh, this lifter says 110 kilos for one rep. This is a warm up set. They're well aware of their depth and trying to work on ankle mobility. Um, they also said they're 17 years old and hoping to compete one day. Um, they have a mock meet coming up in January. So, uh, interesting submission. Not often, you know, do we really break down and analyze a warm up rep, but given that you mentioned specifically the depth and that you're well aware of it and that you're trying to target your ankle mobility to uh, improve that, I, I wanted to take the opportunity to just kind of touch on this maybe quickly, but I don't think it's your ankle mobility that's holding you back. Um, uh, I think that you probably can just go deeper, right? I, I think that there's going to be a way for you to unlock the ability to get depth uh, a little more comfortably. And I can tell you a couple of different ways um, that maybe it will work a little better. So let me get all the things that I want in the shot and none of the things I don't want. Okay, uh, number one, it looks like we're, we're coming pretty forward on the toes here. We can actually see the heels of the shoe lift up slightly. And you might be saying, aha, ankle mobility, I got you. I don't think so. Um, Sure, maybe there's some flexibility demands that are there that could be improved upon, um, but I don't know that that's necessarily the most like bang for your buck approach. What I would probably do first is I would play around with your stance. I would play around definitely with your toe angle. It looks to me like we're just totally straightforward uh, in the toes and in the, in the direction the feet are pointing. And I think a lot of the times you'd be surprised by how much of a difference it could make if you just turned your toes out slightly. Um, like I said, play around with stance angle. Um, and the other thing I would do is play around with your bracing a little bit. Uh, it looks like we're trying to maintain a fair bit of extension here. And a lot of the times the hips don't want to go any deeper um, when we have a pretty extended position. It can be really tough to have the sort of requisite movement in the hips and femurs, right? Like in the pelvis and femurs here, when we are in uh, a fair bit of extension. So sometimes we need to be a little more posteriorly tilted and what I mean by that is instead of being extended we want to be a little more neutral range or even slightly flexed um, throughout parts of the back to allow ourselves to get depth a little bit more comfortably so I'm also not saying give up on your ankle mobility if you find that's making a difference if you're getting something out of that I'm not saying you're wrong I am saying here's some other things to look at if you're trying to improve your depth in a timely manner um, the other thing I would say is you know Obviously, lifting shoes exist for a reason. If you try them out, or even just take one of these little plates here and put it under your heel like this, so that it slightly raises your heel, and just see if that feels good. It might, it might feel great, and it might allow you to get perfect depth without giving up any bracing, and bada boom, there you go. That's fixed. Uh, you can get yourself a pair of lifting shoes uh, if you have the means and the uh, ability to do that. And if not, yeah, continue with all the other things I mentioned, but I did want to touch on that, um, you know, kind of alternative way of looking at different methods that we can, uh, different paths we can go down to try to enhance that depth when we're feeling a little bound up. So I hope that helps. Our next lifter here is Michael. There we go. Let's get this some wild crops. There we go. That looks a little bit more like the right proportions for a human being. Uh, sorry, we were stretching and squishing you so much there, Mike. Now, uh, Michael's doing 405 for eight. He says this is 85%. He's been lifting around five years. Um, just about four to five months of powerlifting style training. So, you know, uh, as things go, excuse me, relatively new to actually transitioning into a powerlifting focus. Now, this is 405 for eight. He says his goal is a 500 pound pull by the end of the year. Uh, he also thinks that he would love to compete one day and thinks he's got some potential uh, in competition, to which I would say, hell yes, go get you some. Um, now, he says he has a bit of trouble with bracing and breathing from the bottom to the top. So, um, you know, trying to think about where we take our breath, how we hold it, where we let it out, um, you know, top, top up or sorry, <laughs> top down versus bottom up setup. 
all those kinds of things come to mind. Um, and he also says he's starting to notice some hip pain. So he's trying to figure out if bracing has anything to do with it. But what we're going to do is we're going to leave this video. It's going to play through one more time. I'm gonna, maybe going to skip to where he starts deadlifting. There we go. We're going to play it through one last time. I want everybody to go down to the comments section below uh, and leave your thoughts and tips on Michael's deadlift. If you see anything you think he can work on to be more efficient, if you see anything um, that might help him in his consistency with bracing and that kind of stuff, leave it in the comments below. Um, if you're interested in helping out and supporting the channel, like, subscribe, comment, use the notification bell thingy. And we also have some beautiful Calgary Barbell merch still for sale on calgarybarbell.shop. Check out our app, calgarybarbell.programs.app. And we will see y'all in the next one next Friday on Form Check Friday. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you later. Okay, bye. Come on, Michael. Do this last rep. It's getting awkward. Toodaloo.